This is the Parker's Allen, and it's in Dune Raphael. Did you know Dune is an anagram for nude? <laughs> but I'm not sure uh, that this is nude, or is it? How you going? Uh, welcome to Bootlosophy, and my name is Tech. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land and waters around here, the Wajit people. This is Parkhurst's plain toe service boot called the Allen. This makeup is in what uh, Andrew calls Dune Rough Out, and I'm not sure if it's a natural undyed tannage or not, but let's go through it. It's a typical service boot pattern, like a, like a World War II boondocker. Uh, six inches high at the shaft, a, a low block heel, a single piece uh, narrow backstay strip, and a low profile plain toe. In the rough out makeup, it's a casual boot, but not rough and ready like a work boot. In Parkhurst's uh, 602, or in this case the newer 602M last, while roomy in the toe box, it still looks pretty sleek, and the almond toe shape is refined. The slightly lighter thread used in the stitching is a nice contrast to the light honey rough out nap color, which is also accentuated by the gold hardware. You surely wouldn't wear it with a suit, but the rough out nap is soft and could pass as a suede, so it befits more smart and neat casual clothing than the lumberjack look. I'd be happy wearing it with chinos and a relaxed button down to go to the office if I'm not meeting any clients. I often wear it with light jeans and t-shirts or polo shirts when it's warm. Or outfits for a casual lunch at a cafe or, or the local pub, uh, like brown pants and a denim shirt. I find blues and browns quite a good match. As I said, relaxed or smart casual. Parkhurst is one of my favorite brands. There. I've said it. <laughs> I have never received any payment or free boots from Andrew, but I have more than my fair share of Parkhurst boots in my collection which I've bought, and they are one brand that every time they drop some new makeups, I will buy at least one, and I've featured so many in my videos, uh, like this OD up there of the original Spruce Kudu. For those of you new to my channel, I'll do a quick intro to the brand. And for those of you who have already seen my other Parkhurst reviews, you can either fast forward or just watch me introduce it again. Parkhurst was founded by Andrew Savisco, a former stock analyst who found a passion in wanting to make American heritage good value traditionally made boots. He founded Parkhurst in 2018 as a small batch manufacturer. What that means is that his model was to design boots and then partner with a local bootmaking factory in upstate New York to make small batches of his boots in different patterns with more unique leathers like Kudu and Halloween's uh, new at the time, Dublin, or Seidel's Veg Retan. Andrew tried to source materials from local suppliers, and even when he bought overseas products like Vibram, Ridgeway, or Daynight Soles, he tried to source them from the local supplier rather than buying them direct from overseas. Apart from the factory, Parkers really was a one-man band where Andrew did everything from finishing off the boots by uh, attaching and finishing the heels himself, uh, doing the final QC checks, packing the boots and mailing, and doing all the customer service. Andrew was hit hard by COVID. Being a small batch manufacturer, that meant he could only afford to buy small stocks of leathers so that often when a drop was sold out, you couldn't get that makeup again because Andrew would have planned a different makeup for the next season. But when COVID struck, when supplies ran out, the supply chain stretched so long that he was unable to get and make and release enough batches of boots. During that difficult time, his stock sometimes disappeared to showing only maybe three or four different makeups or models on his website. And then it got worse. His local suppliers started to be unable to obtain supply themselves. So waiting for veg tan leather insoles, for example, uh, and uh, midsoles or welts took months. Getting the right nails for the heels took forever. This meant that the factory had half finished boots just sitting there, waiting for a small article like nails, for example, and this meant rising holding costs. Then in those COVID years, his suppliers started to go out of business, and eventually his partner factory, which also made boots for other brands, by the way, went out of business themselves. 
If you ran a business like Andrew, like me, you remember what a stressful couple of years 2020 to 2022 was. If you ran a business, you suddenly knew how short a period you had saved in capital to weather through before it got better. As a management consultant, I saw how most businesses were no more than four months sales away from bankruptcy. But in any event, Andrew was lucky because he is such a nice guy that he obviously had built a support base from the businesses he dealt with, and they introduced him to a factory in Spain. I think as much as Andrew bases his mission on supporting American business in order to survive, and he was close to not surviving, let me tell you, he knew he had to transfer manufacture to Europe. In my interview with him, you can watch it up there, he explains how the European system totally helps a boot brand. Through internal connections, the factory put him in touch with outsole manufacturers and other local suppliers. Today, Parkers has continued developing. Uh, for example, they collaborated with Nick's Handmade Boots uh, and he's expanded his styles back to include the Delaware boot and now he's bringing out a version of the Brogue Spalding boot uh, that he used to run. And he's even exploring new styles and lasts with a Portuguese factory. I am a supporter of Parkhurst. This brand, to me, has heart. But let's now turn to the construction of these boots. They are Goodyear welted. Uh, to dive into Goodyear welting, check out my Goodyear Welt 101 video up here that explains everything. But basically, the inside of the boot, that's the insole and the turned in uppers, are stitched to a thin strip of leather called a welt that goes all the way around the boot. On the outside, the welt is then stitched through the sole construction. That's this stitch you can see right here. You can't see the inside stitch, of course. Now that's the basis of Goodyear welt reputation for uh, water resistance. The stitches never go through all the way from outside to inside. They're two separate stitches, so the moisture can't wick through. They are also, of course, eminently resolable because your cobbler can just cut the outside stitch, uh, replace the outsole, and restitch it back. In this case, as in many Parkhurst boots, Andrew uses a split reverse welt for extra moisture resistance. Now, a split reverse welt is where the welt is partially split and then the top of the split is pushed up against the uppers. You can tell it from a storm welt because a storm welt has the lip carved into the welt. And you can see here that the edge of the split is actually just a raw leather edge, meaning that's the edge of the uh, welt originally. The outsole is a rubber compound. It's a proprietary sole made especially for Parkhurst and modeled with the studs to look like a day-night sole. Now, in my opinion, it's a bit softer than the day-night rubber compound and as a result, more comfortable and more grip in the wet. Although it may not be as durable in the long run, so we'll have to see about that. The heel block is stacked uh, veg tan leather and topped by the specially made studded heel top lift. Both the top lift and the outsole are a little over 5mm thick, and the outsole sits on a 4 to 5mm thick veg tan leather midsole, on top of which is the welt. Inside the boot, Parkers fills the cavity caused by that welt going around the edge with a cork filler. Despite someone who commented on one of my shorts about Iron Rangers that cork doesn't belong in boots, <laughs> <laughs> it does, because it's flexible and will mold to the shape of your feet, making it a made-to-measure orthotic support insole. Embedded in the cork is a steel shank that runs between the heel and the ball of the foot, providing arch support and torsional rigidity. On top of the shank and the cork is a veg tan leather insole, and on top of that is a leather half sock liner protecting your heel. Moving on up, as it's a rough out, I don't believe the boots are lined, but they may be in the vamp because it's, it's hard to feel the smooth grain of uh, any lining as being different from the smoothness of the grain side of the leather on the inside. The, the uppers are a light tan rough out from a Spanish tannery. Uh, the name of the tannery is not specified, but that's not necessarily a red flag because European tanneries often contract with lots of brands and, and sometimes create special tannages for them. And the brand rivalry between the uh, shoemakers might dictate that they don't reveal the tannery as a commercial in confidence matter. At any rate, it's quite a thin rough out. Uh, because of the way reinforcing patches are stitched on, I can't really measure the, the thickness of the leather, but I would be surprised if it was more than 1.8 mils thick. 
It's very soft with a very pliable uh, temper and the hand or feel of the nap is gorgeous. I think it might be a split rough out from the top of the hide where the hide is split and the grain side split is then turned inside out. This is what Europeans call a suede rough out. In other words, Americans might actually call this a suede, but from the top split rather than from the bottom split. I mean, the nap is much more reminiscent of a soft Charles F. Stead suede than say a Wicket and Craig work leather rough out. Uh, the Parker's website describes their shorter nap rough outs as a tight grain, full grain leather and is the reverse side of the hide, which kind of agrees with my assumptions. As a casual boot, the leather is sturdy enough, but it's not made for rough out work boot uses. Do not go logging in it. <laughs> uh, the heel counter uh, is, is veg tan leather, and it's an internal heel counter held in place on the inside between the uppers and a suede patch at the heel. On the outside, it's reinforced by a heel strip going up the whole height of the shaft. The toe box is structured with, um, I'm, I think, I'm pretty sure it's elastic. The tongue, is the same leather, uh, turn the grain side out, but much thinner. It's probably one of my uh, only criticisms because it really is thin. It is semi-gusseted though, right up to the fifth eyelet. It's turned grain side up, as I said, so the only marks after a few months of wear uh, are some pressure marks where the, where the oils have been pushed up against. It's also helped by the fact that the gold hardware is very nicely backed and finished with no scratchy exposed bare metal. The stitching overall is really clean and even. The gap between the double stitches is very consistent. The welt stitches are consistent and evenly spaced. While the leather is thin, it is reinforced where it matches at the collar and down the uh, lace facings. The rough out uppers leather is called dune, which mentally I think might mean natural, but I think it really just means the color is sandy. The grain side doesn't look as light as some natural leathers uh, say natural chrome excel. So I'm not sure if this is lightly tanned a tan color or if indeed it's been left uh, naturally nude uh, in the tanning. I know that the nap side is very close in color to Stead's, Charles F. Stead's tobacco suede that R.M. Williams uses, uh, like on the Rickaby boots. It's not very light like you'd expect undyed leather to be in, more of a rich honey color. I like it though. It's a color that can go with blue jeans, tan pants, whites, grays, browns, even black. As for leather care, uh, Parkhurst website suggests that you spot clean with a damp rag, then brush and apply waterproofing spray if desired. <laughs> uh, the absence of a recommendation of a conditioner is on the same page as me. I really don't think this leather needs a conditioner. It's soft and feels like it won't dry and crack even if left alone. I think if you really wanted to scratch an itch though, you could condition the inside with an oil or a cream like Venetian shoe cream. Or alternately, uh, you can use one of those neutral spray-on conditioners for new bucks and suede. Otherwise, look, just keep it clean. As the website says, wipe it with a damp cloth and spot clean if you really, really have to. To me, no, there's Nothing wrong with showing a few hard-worn scuffs and marks and even greasy stains on this leather. Um, I'd brush it from time to time with a stiff suede brush just to raise or realign the nap and uh, brush off dust so that the dust doesn't cake and grind into the leather. As for sizing, I take my usual half size down from Brannock's true measurement. I'm a US 8.5 in D width, which is a UK 7.5 in average width. In these, I take a Parker size 8. Now, Parkers rarely have wide fit models because their 602 and 602 M lasts are combination lasts that are designed around a D width, but made to be narrow in the heel and the waist than a D, and wider than the D at the ball of the feet. To me, the 602 or 602 M last, and Grantstone's Leo last, and I would also include Alden's uh, True Balance last, they're the best for my feet, where I have uh, quite skinny ankles, but a wide ball. If you are a wider foot though, I'd ask Andrew about sizing up. He's really very responsive on email and, and helpful. In terms of comfort, while I was perfect in the 602, I do find I need to either wear thick socks in the 602M or insert a very thin ortholite insole. Otherwise, the comfort is just great. The support and the shape all around makes me feel that my feet are nicely wrapped in the boot. Uh, 
The instep doesn't pinch and my heels are held snugly so there is no heel slip. Meanwhile, the ball of my feet, which are on the verge of going wider than the D, feel snug but not tight like the proverbial firm handshake. Shock absorption is pretty good and the grip of the studs is good in the urban jungle, including manicured lawns. Look, I haven't worn these upcountry, but I, I honestly don't expect any problems if I do. As for value, these cost me uh, US $388 in September 2023, and I believe they're still the same price now. In Australia, I had to pay another 70 US bucks for postage, which is a painful ad. But for $388 US, I think it's bang on price to value. I think so because of the materials, the finishing construction, and for the comfort and plain wearability of this boot. They are in that difficult 350 to 450 range of competition, but I think they hold up well against the Trumans, the Grant Stones, and others. But they are my favorite brand, so take that into consideration. Anyway, that's it. Uh, if you don't have a pair of sandy brown colored boots in suede or rough out, and I don't know if these are, a, uh, are or are not natural and undyed, or in fact they're lightly colored tan, I think these would be an attractive color and style to add to your wardrobe. I hope you liked this review. Now if you did, you can show me by clicking on the like button and help me out there. And of course, you can also help my channel grow, please, by clicking on the subscribe button. Over the next few months, I'm going to bring you a few more Parkhurst models because I, I had a big buy of, uh, across them in, in late last year. Uh, but I'm going to do them in terms of long-term reviews. And I think I'll also look at some sub-collections in my collection, like, you know, undyed naturals or boots of a certain color, and compare the leathers in them and how they wear. So subscribe and you won't miss out. Until then, take care out there and I'll see you soon.